Welcome back to SideQuest, episode 45, Final Fantasy VII, episode big 28, our penultimate episode. And back with me is my my uh, co-host and uh, podcast extraordinaire and teacher extraordinaire, Mr. Wesley Chance. Welcome back, Wes. Hey, it's good to be back. And penultimate for this series, but I'm sure there's many more games and things to talk about after we're done with this. That's right. As all the listeners know who've been listening in since the beginning, we do have about a 50-year-long plan here. And so we're about one year into that. So we have quite a bit of work to do uh, in, in order to fulfill our obligations. And we want to do better than Aristotle does, like when he does in the metaphysics, and he says that he'll talk about a topic later and he never gets back to it. Hopefully, hopefully we can do a little better, especially with this you know, sort of advanced technology. We don't just have to sort of primitively write uh, ink or ink-like material onto pages or you know inscribe it onto stone all we have to do is click a a metaphorically named mouse a couple times and then you know as far as we know unless a myspace happens to anchor into youtube which is very sad um our you know our voices are kept forever are kept forever and so hopefully the lessons from these games and these stories that we're analyzing as well well, uh, Wes, just jump into this. Um, so what we were going to talk about this time was were some side quests for side quests, of course, and to talk about Ultimate Weapon and chasing his, his terrible self down and uh, getting into the ancient forest and getting some goodies there and some pretty easy e experience points and MP too. All my material is really, really just leveling up in there. Um, but the first thing I wanted to mention to you was sort of something interesting psychological. We were way from podcasting for a couple weeks and so I didn't play the game for a couple weeks and I found myself starting to avoid it because what I figured out is that I had become less clear on what it was I had to do and it reminded me quite a bit of playing this game alongside Final Fantasy VIII when I was younger when I would say run up against a boss and then uh, be sort of resentful towards the game if I lost that boss and the fact that I might have to replay a lengthy segment of game like 30 to 45 minutes would have been lengthy to me at that time and then uh, sort of avoid the game for a little while, like I was angry at it, like I was angry at a person and avoiding them, and then sort of forget the threat of the game and where it was I was at. And so I found myself avoiding the game in the same way that I might start avoiding homework in a class where I start to lose sort of um, the pace of the class. And I wondered if that has ever happened to you, whether that did happen to you, and uh, uh, if it did, uh, what was it like, and uh, how did you deal with that? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, there's there's so many ways that we can sort of justify that for ourselves, too. Like, because there's like a million other things that we could be doing instead of playing. So, well, let's just, you know, do some of those other things and, and not worry about it. But but, you know, you know that you're doing that when in the back of your mind, you're like, man, but I but I really want to know, like, what happens next? Because because I don't yeah. remember <laughs> what I'm supposed to be doing. So you kind of it's funny. Yeah, psychologically, I mean, it's like a way of kind of gaining a certain amount of self-consciousness because you're sort of aware that you're you're divided about this and and that's like the beginning of sort of a I don't know a, a coming to realization right because then it's pretty simple like you just turn on the game and and see what happens um it's it's a lot easier to do that than to you know anguish over it uh indefinitely so that's that's my solution anyway well, I think that's an excellent solution because I think that ties nicely into sort of our endeavor here, this weird podcast medium where we we deconstruct games that were um, of seminal importance to us. And that's not even the right word. I would say ultimate importance to us when we were young. Final Fantasy VII was a governing myth of my life So big when I was a young person. And I think that that's still true and it was still formative for many people in our generation who are of that sort of creative RPG playing bent, which I think was a considerable number of people, specifically probably boys, though not of course exclusive to boys. And uh, deconstructing the sort of elements of other myths, like of course, we're going to talk about the weapons, the apocalypse and the Ragnarok today. One a Christian end of time myth, one a Viking or Norse end of time myth and um you know the one i know better than the other um but we're also coming to the end of time of course in this game with a comet coming to destroy us excuse me meteor coming to destroy us from above we will fire fall uh fight essentially a, a fallen angel uh in order to keep this from happening and discover earth sort of feminine power but in the next game we will play uh 
there, there will be a coming to the end of the world sort of motif. And of course, uh, I'm watching a new Netflix show, which I really like called Umbrella Academy, which have, again, focuses on a team of heroes finding their sort of unity in the same way that um, Cloud told everybody to find their why. And that was sort of his ultimate leadership move. And they're fighting to keep the world from ending as well. And so I guess I wanted to talk about the theme of ending and differing perspectives on ending and how it is a new beginning for us um, because we're going to, of course, play another game, which I'm now getting excited for, but I have to put in the work necessary to finish this game first, like the first out in a double play, just to give a baseball metaphor. But I also wanted to ask you a little bit about, um, that's my big question for you looming over this conversation, but I also want to ask you about your motivations in doing this. When you first got into doing this particular segment, side quest, and in particular this game, back with Vince so long ago, why why did you do it, and how has your motivation changed? Because if I were just to put something I thought before that um, in response to this is, when I was in graduate school with you, I thought I was going to write a dissertation for a sort of Jungian psychology PhD, perhaps in a literature, perhaps in a psychology department that was very weird, um, and I thought that what we have done here would essentially have been my great work. And A, we've just sat down and done it. B, we're not doing it for money. C, we're not doing it for a degree even. So it's like, D, what, what is it we're doing here? And what have we done? And how has what we've done, uh, I guess, accorded with your expectations? And how has what we're doing changed for you since the beginning? That, that's a great, I mean, that's a great way of kind of posing a question about endings because the other meaning of end, right, is like purpose, um, to go back to Aristotle, right? That's one of the, the forms of a, of a thing or like one of the ways in which a thing is what it is, right, is in terms of what it's directed towards. And I mean, I think that's just like basically true and, and a, a good way to explore, you know, the nature of being or, or something like that is through kind of activities that are goal directed you know, and like figuring out what a thing is. And, and like, you know, when you're playing this game as a kid, that's nowhere in your mind, right? But, but in some ways, maybe it's just there like latent and not articulated. And so, you know, reading a lot of stuff and thinking about a lot of other great books and things, then I wanted to go back and see if these games really stand up and really kind of offer some language in which to understand the world in the way that a great book does. And you know, offer some language with which to understand the work itself, like internally what it's doing. And I think that it really definitely does the latter. And I think it also does the former, maybe, maybe not quite so coherently as it seemed, you know, when we were kids playing these games and they sort of gave us a lens with which to see the world. But, but it definitely has a certain sparkle to it, you know, even when you overlay it with all these much more powerful uh, works of, of the sort that the Greeks, you know, and and all the great books of the West and, and whatnot, you know, provide you with. I, I do think that there's, um, you know, something to be said for uh, looking back at the things that you grew up with and, and investigating them seriously in the light of what you've learned since. I think, you know, there's a great attraction to me to the idea of teaching these games at some point. And so like, you know, giving it a real close read, so to speak, and in this way that we've been doing, is a preliminary to that and, and maybe, a, uh, maybe a way of kind of exploring what topics to focus on and, and what connections they have with other great works, you know, and, and other research and things that are out there. And, and so I think that's one way that the project has really developed is like from talking to you and Vince, you know, amongst ourselves, we also have kind of branched out and talked to a lot of other scholars and, and started, at least started to kind of of delve into the existing research um, about games, you know, in general, but but more specifically about this kind of niche of, um, you know, Japanese culture. Um, th there's obviously way more to explore there, but at least we've kind of begun to uh, scratch the surface of that and find the ways that we can kind of contribute, I think, meaningfully to like a, a really a really interesting but a really problematic academic conversation that's going on these days. Like, I think we're sort of on the outskirts of that and maybe offering a, pr a productive way forward. Um, if that's not too pretentious, like, I don't know if anyone really um, 
has thought about these games in quite this way. Um, and if they have, you know, I'm all, I'd love to hear from them. <laughs> that's, I think that's kind of the next step, you know, as we sort of consolidate what we've made here and um, transcribe and, and expand on it and work on it further. Like, I think, you know, continuing to, to talk to other people, but also to hear from other people and get, get their critiques and get their in, input um, is going to be uh, really exciting. So that, that's kind of where I, I stand on that whole question for now. That's an excellent answer. And I do want to talk about the theme of time at the end here, Ultima weapon, ultimate weapon received that is, I think, literally called Ultima weapon, a material called Ultima that we use. Then Final Fantasy IX will actually be an ultimate sort of material. It's obviously very nasty and very powerful in this game, but n not like Knights of the Round. It is, it is way overpowered, I guess I would say, in uh, nine. Though it will be the ultimate attack of Genova in this game uh, as well. And then, of course, we, we get these ultimate final weapons. Ultima, of course, comes from the Latin, and it means final. So pin ultimate is the next to final, or the right before the final. So that's a very useful word, especially if you ever learn some Latin and some Greek, and you need to know which syllable to accent uh, so that you put the right emphasis on the right syllable. <laughs> um, in any case, um, time is a major um, does seem to be a major theme that's coming together at the end of this, uh, at the end of, in these end times uh, <laughs> that we are now a part of. And so I guess I wanted to talk a little bit about what the game is doing with time, what comment it's making on time, the sense of nostalgia that we talked about in the pre-show that I'm now feeling for the things I now do not have time for. I suppose if I look at it in uh, a primary world way rather than a secondary world way, it's like I could go back and do many things that I have not but I don't actually have the time in the real world to do that because we have to keep moving just like, uh, you know, we're on a course, we're in a course, we're on a curriculum, we have a career that we're moving towards. We can only move one direction. But I do also, you know, I think I mentioned a few weeks ago that I was looking through, uh, I was looking for some advice on Jagged and I accidentally clicked on another link which sort of mentioned all the special things that happen in a team's party when certain characters are present in it. And I had missed so many of those. Um, especially because I'd mostly just been using Barrett and Red 13 for no particular reason. And that even came forward in the fact that I got the Minerva armband recently, which is named for Minerva, who is the Roman version of Athena, goddess of wisdom in Warcraft, you know, strategic, practical wisdom. Um, and I didn't have any girls on the team to put that on. And though I will, for this final boss fight, have to beef up my whole team, because I think we have to fight three different teams against, uh, against the first form of Sephiroth and if any of them die and I think that's an interesting comment on balance uh, you lose um, but so that's what I wanted to ask you about first I, I have a more self-indulgent question to ask you about uh, next which is what do you think we are doing joining a, an existing community or forging a community um, but maybe I'll save that for later. Again, I'll pin that for later. That's a self-indulgent question. I guess we should talk about the content some. I want to talk about time with you, if you have some comment on that. Yeah, I, I think the, the way the game deals with time does seem to be primarily through um, like the, uh, the, the clock, you know, there in the bottom corner. You always see it when you go into the menu screen. And when you save the game, you see how much time you've put into it. And so it's always sort of present there. And, and in a way, it's a challenge, I guess. It's like you can see how fast you can go through the game. Or on the other hand, you can see like how much time you've put into the game and sort of be proud of that, maybe. Um, I think those, you know, either of those has some, some validity to it. Um, but there's also this sense in which like one thing that's kind of cool about of several of the Final Fantasy games, they, they make a big deal about the active time battle system right so that like there's some kind of sense of real time you know when you're like making your choice about what to do what command to use um the, the enemy is also like able to to act during that time it's not like stopping like in chess or something where you're waiting for a move it's like playing chess with a clock or even playing chess where the, the opponent can move you know while you're thinking about what move you're going to make or something like that so it really that would be interesting um, yeah it can become very like frantic um, there's, you know, there's an element of, um, you know, the, the game uh, having a kind of intelligence that that, that that sort of puts into your head um, because, you know, you can 
see how long it takes you to think of doing things in the game. Meanwhile, it's just doing, you know, tons of damage to your party or whatever it is the enemy decides to do. Um, and I, I think, you know, to the, the point about like the party as, as a group or as a community, that's, that's hinted at in various ways. Um, and one of the ways that it's sort of, it, it evades you actually is in battle because you can only ever use three people at once in this Final Fantasy. And I think that in other games, they, they do that differently. Like I was thinking about this the other day. Um, I think it's in FF10 when for the first time you can on the fly in the middle of a battle switch out party members. Yes. And I remember that being a pretty cool innovation. Um, and in FF2, in the US anyway, it's called number two, on the SNES, in that one, your party members, um, you don't get to really pick them. They sort of come in and out through the, throughout the story until by the end of the story, you have your final five-person party. And, um, and, and I think that's a cool way to do it too, but that, that does seem to be one of those elements of the game that uh, Square, you know, the developers, the story writers are constantly sort of coming back to and, and tinkering with and thinking about how to how to do something different, how to put a different spin on it. And, um, you know, as far as like making a community, that, that does seem to be sort of the, uh, the opposite, right, of whatever the bad guys are doing. Um, so in some sense, yeah, I think that must sort of be the goal uh, as, as the heroic uh, band of, of world savers. Yeah. So it's like what you have to do is choose a big enough sort of, principle or not principle but goal or task or enemy that brings out the best in you and makes you have to be as kind and generous and genuine towards people possible and also honest in order to reveal to them just how big it is the threat it is you're fighting against and at first it's almost as if they had sort of a childish perception of this like they were suit they were the hero that could do no wrong like the night in the storybook that you read to a child before bed and that the enemy was so obvious as a dragon, even so, so much, so obviously malevolent that he even kills a dragon in front of you. Right. Like, uh, and, and in, in the, um, in the Nibelheim scene, when you go back in time for the first time, again, time. Um, but also, also he, he, you know, he sort of crucifies that basilisk looking Midgar Solemn. They can mess you up with beta when you first go across if you don't have a, a chocobo, which is one of those, you know, humbling battles, right? And again, you just see him just put it on a stick, turn it into shish kebab. And so, uh, you know, Sephiroth's such a clear, malevolent force in this game that it's very easy for the, the, the people in the game to forget their own small malevolences and their own betrayals and their own um, uh, closer-to-home battles that they have had to fight through Barrett. Uh, of course, with returning home, Sid never leaving home, though wanting to. Of course, Ares sort of leaving one home, going to a spiritual home and sort of dying there. Yuffie, uh, if you return to, it's an optional in the same way that she's sort of an optional character. If you return to Wutai, you can fight through sort of uh, the pillars of the past for her. Interesting that she, you know, is of course a female character though, uh, which is interesting because it's like, you know, they're overcoming past prejudices or something there. And of course, Cloud has his major um, coming to realization that he's not even the person that he thought he was. But I think that part of what that's trying to tell to us is that we are not the person that we thought we were. And, and, and that if we look at our own choices rather than at the choices of others, we might find that there's a lot that we could clean up ourselves. I think that's essentially the message of Augustine's confessions, why, you know, scholars get hung up on just how bland some of the situations are in which he finds himself. Like he does have that one miracle situation where he hears, uh, what is it? What is it? Uh, uh, Labe Tom Bilion Kai Lege, pick up the book and read it in Greek, in ancient Greek. Uh, probably Koine Greek at that time. Yeah, those words don't make that much of a difference, depending on whether it's ancient or Koine. Very easy Greek. That's why I could. That's why I could translate it. Um, and um, but he, you know, he talks about also like an apple tree, like that George Washington story is modeled after. That he could never tell. That he could not tell a lie at some point. But the whole thing about Augustine is that he could tell a lie, right? That he cuts down this apple tree just for the malevolence of it, just because he's egged on, and he still thinks about this to this day. And I think that's part of what the game developers are doing with a making us make those choices with our party and uh, also putting that time clock on the wall that 
even in this game, choices matter because there are certain things that you'll have to go back and play the game through again, or you'll have to go back to an old save point in order to make happen in this game. And I think that's also part of the sort of repeated appeal of this game that, uh, and the fact that people can play through this game 20 times and not get bored, even though they could play so many different games. And I'm sort of interested in your idea on, on that. And also what you have gotten this time through the game that you did not get the first time through and <laughs> what you might have gotten the first time that you didn't get this time as well. Just to put, you know, another feast sized question in front of you. Right. Yeah, no, so much comes to mind as you're talking about that. Um, the first thing I would say about uh, dragons and party members, um, like the one of the original RPG type games that I remember playing anyhow is Dragon Warrior, I want to say it's called, on the NES. It could be called Dragon Quest. I could be getting that wrong. I think, I think it might Dragon be Dragon Warrior. Quest. Is it Dragon Warrior? Warrior? I think there is a Dragon Quest, too. I would not be surprised. But anyhow, this game that I'm thinking of, you, you play as, you know, the knight, and all that you get to do is sort of go around killing monsters, um, gaining experience and gold, and, and gaining levels. And, and so you eventually sort of become that that hero figure um but there's no other party members there's not really much story you know it's like very bare bones and I, and it you know the game was very rudimentary at that time on on the nes like it was still a fun game i would still totally play that game <laughs> but but it's just different right and and so i think there's an element of like what what the technology allows you to do um you, you talked about that a while ago with respect to writing versus a uh, recording voice, you know, and, and getting to talk to people across the other side of the world or whatever it might be, right? Well, I think, you know, there's something to that as well with, um, with the way that video game technology has developed, which, which is a very, very interesting aspect of this, because I think that to tell the kind of story that Final Fantasy games tell, they really sort of push the existing technology to the limits that they can sort of accomplish and yet have a, a game that's going to be, um, you know, remunerative for them <laughs> that they're going to make money on still. So there, there's that kind of balance that they have to strike. Uh, but, but I think, you know, in this game, it's, it's primarily with like graphics um, and, and stuff like that. But there, there's also the element of the story. It's a longer game. It's three discs long. That's unprecedented. And, and so there's that, there's the time travel thing, right. To go back to that. I, I think that's, that's if not new uh, in the series, at least it hasn't been done with that kind of um, emphasis, right, on like your character's past being this thing that he can't remember, you know, the way that all the other characters in your party emphasize that they can remember, you know, what went wrong in their past and how they're trying to fix it, you know, so, and then um, one other little detail that I think of with, with the clock on the wall, so in uh, Final Fantasy three. The, the one released under that name in the U.S., you go around and, and you can find the elixir in, like, in each town, in one of the clocks somewhere, usually in the inn, there, there'll be an elixir item. If you just check it, it'll pop into your inventory. And, you know, that's like the ultimate item because it, you know, res it fully restores your character. Um, so in some sense, like an awareness of time or like a curiosity about time is the ultimate um, you know, the elixir of life or something like that is like symbolically, I guess, how you could kind of interpret that. Yeah, um, maybe even understanding the value of it. Yeah, yeah. And and there's so much value in those items that I hardly ever use them. <laughs> like I get it in my inventory and it yes. sits there till the end of the game. So, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, uh, I guess you can, you can take that in lots of, in lots of ways. But, um, but there's also like, it just, it's sort of, interesting to me that I think that's where the um, the limits on the party in battle sort of come in is like the technology and the ability of the player to keep things straight is such that it's difficult to have more than three characters that you're controlling in one battle at one time you know and so there's never really like a, a very strong story-wise explanation for why all your team members aren't just like you know beating up all these enemies together all the time they say something like, you know, we can't travel in too big of a party or people will get suspicious. But at this point in the game, like that's completely moot. And so, you know, when you're finally deep in 
the cavern, then yeah, your, your full party sort of comes into play for the first time really. And you, you have to make separate uh, groups and you've got to kind of balance out all your equipment and, and make sure everybody's, you know, up, got, you know, uh, sufficient uh, levels to, to, to survive down there against some of the hardest enemies that you're going to face. Right. So, so that, that sort of finally comes together there. Um, but again, I, I think the way that, you know, in later Final Fantasy, as I, I haven't played beyond 10, so I, I'm not sure what happens after that, but, but they definitely sort of give some thought to how to incorporate larger parties um, into it, which I find interesting to wonder about. Um, right. It to, the, to the repetition, just to throw out the thought about the repetition question and, and like what's different at this stage um, playing, I, I, I have not, you know, thought this hard about the game before. And, and so what I lose with that is like a certain amount of like relaxation when I play because I'm like trying to think about what's going on. But, but what I gain, I think, is much more valuable, which is, you know, the beginnings of a, a kind of theory or, you know, at least certain tidbits of knowledge that I otherwise would have missed. So. Right. I, I do agree that it's almost as if it, while we enter the more reflective half of our lives, you, uh, we, uh, you know, we take more time to do the things we do and we perhaps do fewer things, but we perhaps extract more meaning from the things we've done and that we even find a useful thing to do is to reflect on the things we've done before in a very sort of Dante's Purgatorio uh, sort of way. And in Dante's Purgatorio, one, so one struggles during the day to expurgate one's, th one's sin through, uh, practical, through physical suffering um, and often having to come together with others, like with the envious, they have to rely on others in order not to fall off an edge rather than to try and stand above them and uh, the proud are, of course, bent over um, all the way uh, so that they, they're bent over at a 90-degree angle about. And, but at night, whatever terrace of purgatory you happen to be on, you sit and reflect. And the students always ask me why the day is split up like that. And I say, well, why do you think our day is split up in that way? It's to give you time to process the things you did during the day in order to understand what actually happened and what it is that you are doing moving forward and how to correct small errors that you made the day before. And in order to have that sort of goal-oriented life like you were talking about with aerosol, to have a telos, to have a final cause, as he would say with this four cause theory. Um, and that it is those minute differences between days that make for a good life or show your progress on a graph in life. And so that's sort of the Sisyphean act as um, Friedrich Nietzsche says that Sisyphus would have to love life. But I think that is the difference between sort of heaven and hell and something that the, the clock on the end of uh, Final Fantasy VII and the fact that you level up and gain experience draw attention to that hell is sort of doing the same thing every day in a groundhog day sort of fashion. Um, and I think there's actually a recent... A uh, show on Netflix called Russian Doll, which I haven't watched through all the way, that has the same conceit. Uh, also, there was a Tom Cruise movie a few years back where he had to sort of win a battle in that way. So that theme comes up over and over again. The idea of doing the same thing over and over, that we like exist on an infinite desert, which in California we actually sort of do, next to an infinite ocean, the Pacific. But that um, what this game sort of brings into our minds is that when you make these small improvements – that that's what creates greatness over time or, or produces an incredible effect over time. Many pieces of water or many, you know, many uh, ounces of water create a large body of water. Many notes in a song create one large harmony or symphony. Many, you know, voices in a, in a chorus create a literal symphony. Uh, um, and so it's as if what this game is sort of trying to clue us into is that how you live a good life is a life of progress towards a goal, ideally a very uh, highfalutin goal that also requires you to understand yourself and therefore others in the pursuit of it. But that that is, that is one of the big takeaways, I would say, from this game, that it is saying that that's how you should live, not just within this game world, but within your life. And I would say that this game did start to clue me into that sort of thing. I, I sort of like put the video games down at 18 and started hitting the gym, not to be a meathead, but just sort of to be healthy and to be fit. And I wanted to look like these game characters, except for, you know, not with the oblong dimensions, but you know, I was, I was not the most attractive high school student. So I wanted to do better in college. 
And, um, you know, that's, I think, one of those takeaway lessons that this game actually did give to me, that incremental progress leads, leads to ex- extraordinary results over time. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, I mean, that, that's, that's hammered home in a way towards the end of the game when you start to get, you know, such powerful spells, such powerful equipment. And some of them, like the Apocalypse Sword, has, has yes. triple growth on it. Right? So then you sort of rapidly start to multiply your ability to get better. You know, so you're not only getting better incrementally, but like getting better at getting better or something like right. that. Right? So that, that's, that's sort of, so you get like an experience plus materia um, somewhere in Gold Saucer, I think, is where you find that one. You find that Apocalypse Sword in the ancient forest at the end of it in the cave. I mean, that thing is so, so useful um, to start to master out some of your materia. Um, and I think Sid has the only other triple uh, materia growth weapon that you find down in the submarine uh, or somewhere like that. And so that's definitely my like final party is Cloud with the Apocalypse Sword, Sid with his triple materia growth weapon. And then uh, I think I have Tifa or Yuffie usually as the third because they have some, you know, double growth stuff that's, you know, pretty awesome as well. That's really interesting because that makes me want to ask you about ultimate weapons and ultimate magic and A, how the materia, if you master it, is born, it bears a new one, and how that bears on your comment about the sort of mistake of Sephiroth, who became sort of the superhero of the world, uh, had a no growth materia sword it's as if he had reached the end of everything in the same way that we do, but that he takes the wrong path. He decides to burn everything down in a Joker from Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight uh, sort of way, but uh, rather than teaching and giving something new, whereas the material itself literally bears a new fruit when it is mastered and, and what you thought that meant and how also you thought um, the ultimate weapons with their zero material growth relate to the weapons that come just before like especially with cloud the apocalypse weapon has triple materia growth and how that differs from say the ultimate weapon that you get actually just before then you you get the ultimate weapon from defeating all uh ultima weapon and then you have the option to go into the the ancient forest and get the apocalypse and what do you think of the fact that you get your ultimate weapon first, that it has no material growth, and that the weapon leading up to it has triple material growth? It, yeah, it's very interesting the way they structure that. It is possible to, to get to the ancient forest much earlier if you get a gold chocobo. Um, right, so that right, was right. my that was my big innovation this time playing through, was to get a gold chocobo earlier, go to the ancient forest, and the enemies were a bit harder, but you know, it's still much it's still totally doable to get through and, and get that that sword a lot earlier. Um, so there's that, but there's also like the ultimate weapon for cloud is really curious in another way. Cause it, um, it does more damage the higher his HP is or like the closer to maxed out his HP is maybe is, is how ah. it works. So, so as long as he is in pristine health, not on Sephiroth, like who can never be damaged, right? When, when you're in your flashback, um, ah. his, his, his strikes are, are more powerful, right? So, there's something very interesting going on there about sort of his sort of like peak performance mode. Um, and I think each of the ultimate weapons has some kind of weird little quirk to it like that. I think Yuffie's, it's like it works really well with morph materia or something like that. Mm. Um, I forget what the other ones are. You know, they all have something weird going on. And so they have no growth. And so in a way, they pair perfectly with materia that is mastered right? Because it's like not going to grow anyway. And so there's that. I mean, you can do that and it makes your party really strong. But again, like that's, that's only something you can do when you feel that you can't grow any further. Um, and, and I think that's the point at which you've played the game too long, <laughs> frankly. Right. Uh, I only use the ultimate, you know, weapons when I'm in basically the final boss battle because otherwise I want to be gaining, you know, material I want my material to grow like it just gives me a great pleasure to see that kind of growth happen and and when you master one yeah you get a new material that pops out and that's really just like a, a miracle of life right there. <laughs> what can I say uh and and plus you know as Vince pointed out a while ago when you master in all materia it's one of the first ones you're likely to master and when you do you can sell the mastered one for a, a ton of gill if that's the sort of thing you need 
Um, so that's like, it just adds to the um, sort of strategy of the game in that way. It, it makes you sort of reflect on how perfection is always sort of receding because like you get a new one that's starting at, at zero again, you can start right up with that one. Um, and then it makes you sort of aware also of like that different tools are useful in different situations. I, I guess I'd say like if you start using ultimate weapon right away, you miss out on, on some other important kinds of, of gameplay, I guess. Right. And I, so this Jungian psychologist from America called Edward Edinger wrote in his famous book, Ego and Archetype, that he saw a major difference between the archetype of the number three and the number four, and that he saw that tension in Christian Catholic mysticism and the idea of the Trinity and the Trinity and the idea that in Vatican II, um, Mary was assumed in heaven, effectively making the Trinity into a quaternity. And that um, the unions made a big deal about the idea of the quaternity as a symbol for the ever revolving wholeness of reality. So that which always is, but is always uh, moving in an active way, very similar to Aristotle's idea of the unmoved mover, uh, that, that sense of agency and activity being present in the concept, eternally, perfectly moving. And so uh, what I see interesting here is that you get that triple material growth with the, the so-called apocalypse. And apocalypse literally means to be, um, to be uncovered. Um, Calypso, which is the name of a character who has, you know, as you know, from the same Greek class I was in, and it, it, with, uh, you know, uh, God rest her soul, Dr. Mara Flamenhoff, um, I think died this year, very unfortunately. Um, but she taught us much, and so we're very happy about that. But she brought attention to us uh, when we were translating that work to the use of the word kaluktain and kryptain, the word for to cover and to, to um, uh, hide, uh, and the differences between how those words play out in the last stanza of the Greek of the Odyssey. But that um, the idea of an apocalypse is something is revealed. So that's why revelation is sometimes called apocalypse in the Christian tradition. But I wonder whether um, sort of what you're saying here is that you become so good at growing and transforming in this game that that's one definite thing you can keep doing. I think that kept me playing the first time I was playing. It's like, look at how great I can become. And then when I played Elder Scrolls Morrowind later, I think I got to the top of like 11 guilds because just that, that love, not just of the static glory of being great, but of uh, the pleasure of being better and better at getting great at things, at um, homing down the process. It was almost as if evolution was playing out in my, <laughs> in my desire to play games at a better and better level. And I wonder to what extent even this is a manifestation of that same instinct. Because now, as you've mentioned, we're sort of playing the game at a meta level. We're trying to sort of play it as literature and to unpack it and see what's there. And we found quite a bit, as we always, as we always thought. But how that plays out in tension to the sort of Sephirothian or ultimate weapon ideal where, you know, perfection is reached. It is sort of deadening, right? It is sort of like yeah, the game's over then, and you want to go start this process over again. It reminds me a lot of the game 500, where, where there would be one thrower, God, and then the receivers. Um, and I loved getting to 500, but I hated becoming the thrower. <laughs> That's a great analogy. Yeah, and the way that that game keeps happening is by continually revolving out the person who's, who's throwing, right? And right. I guess that's sort of what Sephiroth seems to have... Uh, neglected or or maybe just sort of hidden from himself in some way right uh, a lie that he tells himself that he will never be replaced as thrower um, and I, I think right. it's funny how like up until the very end you're still uh, finding new materia too so materia that has no growth on it yet at all that you have to start from scratch and it's some of the most powerful materia in the game you know naturally enough like well, obviously, Knights of the Round, like, if you find that, it takes forever to master that thing. Um, and there's, like, uh, shield materia and uh, counter magic materia and all kinds of, there's W item, there's W summon, right? Stuff that you don't get until the very end of the game that then you have to start leveling up from scratch. And, and so, like, again, even if you try to 
you know, get it a little faster, get it a little sooner, it's still going to mean like that's, that's all that time that you're going to need to put into um, the game if you want to reach kind of perfection. But if what you're more interested in is in the growth, then you're sort of automatically rewarded for that by, by finding these new things. Even as a, you're at kind of the end of the game, you're, you're sort of given an opportunity to, to start again with each new material that you find, with the way in which you have to form three parties, you know, like you're, you're sort of starting fresh, uh, even as the game is winding down. And, and there's, I think that that's kind of built into the, the story of the game as well, right? I mean, we'll get to it, I guess, next week when we see the way that the ending plays out. Um, but there, there's a pretty strong kind of um, renaissance in the sense of rebirth motif going on. And, and I think the apocalypse thing, yeah, pointing out that, that uh, route and, and where we learned about that route in, the, in our Odyssey class, that's, I mean, I think that's very apt because Odysseus, in a way, so his, his character embodies that process of using, yes. you know, not brute strength anymore, not even necessarily battle prowess or strategy anymore, which he was always associated with, but like the capacity to learn, you know, as the most powerful full of virtues in some ways and you know he's blessed by the gods for 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 his ability to continually you know trick and tell stories and and accomplish his homecoming um which is so rare among the heroes of the archaic world um i think you know the apocalypse versus the ragnarok versus the ultimate weapon there there is i think there's the the seeds of a, of a pretty interesting essay there, um, to say the least. So I, I like that you pointed that out. Yeah, and just, it's so funny too. I mean, not only with heroes not finishing their, their, their journeys, and, but even those that do, eventually, you know, there will be a journey they do not complete, right? There will be a failure. There will be a fall at some point. And, um, you know, how you deal with that perhaps determines whether you're more of a Christ or more of a Luciferian figure because mo both literally as Christ is killed, he has risen, right? He has put up on a crucifix, but he, he dies in the same way that Lucifer falls, but he seems to have to accept that. And there seems to be a difference between them in that way. One is a divine way of dealing with things. One is sort of a diabolical resentful way of dealing with things. But, um, Funny that you mentioned that again, beginnings and ends. We are about to finish this major project, and you just put out on the Well Read Mage an essay where we were talking over the summer about starting this project and trying to convince Sarah to start our Harry Potter project, which we're about to finish that uh, fifth book and get into the sixth book um, uh, tomorrow. And again, just that idea of using time wisely, being present there. We are putting in the work regardless of what the value is now with like the, the random, the seemingly random notes when the harmony is present, I think something substantial will have, will, will have been done. Um, there was another point that I, I wanted to make too, but going out on that, that branch, ah, yes. And of course, I'm very proud to announce that I did finish my Odyssey course that is now online. And so now I have not only an Iliad course out, but also a full Odyssey course on every single book in that. And uh, I'd say some lectures are better than others, um, but we'll smooth that out throughout time. Um, it, that is now a resource that is available to everybody. And I'm happy that I got to mention one of the roots of my knowledge, Dr. Mara Flamenhoff, because of course, you know, I am, I am, if I live up to my destiny, someday going to be a dead teacher whose lessons hopefully live on in those who I taught. Um, and so just interesting personal connections. Oh, totally. Yeah, I, I, I think the uh, the prospect of having, um, you know, books and lectures and and courses and things is is cool. But I agree that it's way more important to have you know students, uh, you know, people who actually you know, are listening in and and learning from and and adapting the ideas in their own ways. I think that's the way in which you know the learning sort of truly gets transmitted. Uh, I I think. The uh, the Odyssey course is really, I mean, what I've heard of it so far is really well done. I think it's cool that you managed to incorporate your classes into that project. Um, and, you know, it's lucky for those who listen like me 
who are not in the class because I don't have to do any of the work. I just get to listen. <laughs> uh, but then in, on the other hand, you know, I, I think that there's, there's something to be said for um, raising the bar a little higher and like having, you know, quizzes or having uh, research papers and presentations and all that good stuff. You know, that as difficult as it is, that or like translating out of Greek, like we did in our class, like that stuff really helps to, to get the lessons to stick. Um, there is something to be said for, for putting in the work. Uh, but, you know, there's, there's got to be a, a, a balance there, like in anything. Um, I agree. You, you wanted to say something about nostalgia and nostalgia for missed opportunities, I think, before we sign off here. Did you have a thought about that? Yeah, so I, I, I definitely have been dancing around that this today and and that is a theme the entire time we've been going through this this game and I think that is a major theme especially as you get into Advent children with Cloud who seems just uh, incapable of moving on after attaining this ultimate hero status it's like how do you move on with life after that and Carl Jung actually talks about a certain tribe uh, I can't remember whether they were uh, indigenous to America or Africa but one of their practices was that after a man had performed heroically in battle, that they would ostracize him, sort of like the Greeks, for two months and starve him so that he wasn't so inflated that he was unbearable. But I, I just wanted to mention my sort of nostalgia, again, coming to the end here, and soon I will be coming to the end of the semester, too, after going through this terrible grind the last three weeks with research papers and managing my students through that. And I did get a 100% turn-in rate, only a couple even tardy. And th that itself was a mammoth achievement for me, just managing that. Uh, it is a huge, I mean, if you know an English teacher and they manage a research paper and they get those students to turn those pieces of work in, they've done a lot of work. But also at that time, managing oral examinations, which I'd never done before, and I got all of those in. I actually do still have one student who, who is sometimes ill um, for stretches to, to get, but he will be taking his oral exam at some point, not in a punitive way. I'm looking forward to it, and I'm sure he is too. But, you know, that's been a lot of work. It, but, but thinking about the missed opportunities I've had in this game, like I, I, because I've been playing it so quickly and cavalierly, I've made some connections to – Am I just playing it that way or is that just how I am when I try and do things and do I miss things? And the answer seems to be partially yes. And also that even though I have gotten so much more out of this game, I haven't fixed some fundamental flaws in how I pursue uh, bettering uh, myself or sharpening myself through an instrument like a game. Because I definitely have rushed at times when I should have gone slower. I haven't gotten as much diversity of experience through having a more diverse party. I've just sort of uh, played in the way I have. And recently that led to me actually avoiding the game, as I said, because I, I like a student has been avoiding his homework and uh, sort of not acknowledging the existence and the, the difficult uh, preparations necessary for a, a good class. I, you know, started to get sort of intimidated by the game. It's like, oh no, I started avoiding it because I would have to put in a lot of work at the end that I should have been putting in during the course of the game. And so I found myself like five or set five to seven levels beneath what I needed to be to fight Sephiroth. I don't have a lot of good uh, defenses against instant death, which some of these characters, uh, many of these characters in the final dungeon are capable of casting. And uh, also I don't have a well-balanced team. And so that sort of led to my nostalgic thoughts about other things I'd missed in the game uh, just because just because I've been sort of rushing through and even though I've given it a lot in one way intellectually I still there are still many many depths that I have left uncovered and it would be really great to go back through this game at some point especially with a class of people that are really interested in it possibly people that are playing it for the first time but love video games and stories possibly people who have played it before and really want to add to the discussion because when, especially when Vince was here, like he played the game in such a dynamically different way from me that he was always discovering things that I, I never would discover. And of course, getting to talk to you, you, you think in a way and see things and have played the game in a way that I don't. And that's just helping me to understand how important a community is to an endeavor like this, to an intellectual endeavor, to the loving of a game. A game is so much more than just the game. Um, and it tells you so much more about yourself than it does even about the characters in front of you. And we've learned quite a bit, right? Um, and so I'm experiencing the nostalgia of lost opportunities and not balancing my team and also sort of the nostalgia 
of missed opportunities to become better than I am now so that I didn't have to cram so much before the final exam, which is definitely a bad habit I've had for most of my life. I, you know, probably <laughs> the sort of habit you have to break yourself of rather than one that you fall into. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, I can I can definitely empathize there. Um, I I think that's sort of the human condition, though, right? Like you're always going to be a little underprepared uh, when faced with something that is is pretty awesome and um, awe inspiring. Um, so I don't know. It just it just sort of adds to the replay value of the game and and the idea that you know you could go back and explore it with a class of people or with other people who've maybe never played it. Like that's going to become more and more true. I think as time goes on as as this game becomes kind of an antique in a way, right? Like uh, we'll right. have to, people would have to seek it out and, um, and hopefully, hopefully they will. It'll be really cool to see. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, something I potentially like to talk about in the future um, because that is what we're trying to do is it's funny that I, I also stopped playing after final fantasy 10 and sort of like your gamer age, sort of like in fitness, we talk about your lifting age when you started lifting where you're at now, 15, 20 years later, what sorts of problems you might start to see developing as you lift poorly over time or well, but usually poorly. Um, and, uh, here sort of, you know, we had a very similar gamer age too. It was like sort of up until college. And then we had to do, you know, devote our time to some other things. Um, some people didn't, but I think we sort of went along a similar trajectory. And, um, you know, sort of getting into the Final Fantasy VII, what, I think I got on that board that late. I didn't play, I didn't have an SNES, I did Genesis, so I played a lot of Sonic. So it took me a while to find my love of video, of RPGs. It actually took me until seventh grade. Um, but that we sort of, started in similar places and also ended in similar places. It's very interesting to me for what it is precisely that we got and why it is so important for at least our generation to focus on these games, even if they won't have the same effect on generations to come, except in a more scholastic form. Yeah, yeah, I think, I mean, again, it's gonna be very interesting to see what the myths are that this you know the young generation now what they have as myths i think it, it probably kind of like the the shows you're referring to on netflix and stuff like that is is likely um where they're coming to this from and so they'll definitely see different things in it and and take different things away from it um but yeah i think it has to me it's aged pretty well all things considered uh i i hope that others will will see the same yeah as do i as do i and well so I guess we got to get this Apocalypse Ragnarok Ultimate episode started. Yes. So we... Gosh, man, that, that cave is big. Give yourself at least a couple hours to get through that sucker. I will. I will. I intend to play not just once this week, but twice. Um, probably when you're recording, doing some other interesting things. And so, uh, ah, yes. Ah, yes. Where are you right now on the Golden Compass His Dark Material series? And then I guess we can end with that. Oh, yeah, I, I'm, I think, three or four chapters from the end now. So uh, about two or three weeks to go on that, on that project. Um, probably around the time that we're starting our next uh, side quest, I'll be starting some other game. I think I'm going to try to play Xenogears uh, for that project while we play Majora's Mask for this one. If that's, I don't know if that'll be too much video game for me though i might have to find something a little lighter but we'll see that's pretty incredible that's pretty incredible well i'm gonna have to go on my own little odyssey and find an n64 in majora's mask uh i don't think it'll be that <laughs> that that hard because it wasn't that hard to find this ps3 but you know yeah there's something to be said for not underestimating the difficulty of a task at the beginning because everything is more complex than it seems. Nothing is as it seems as I think we learned so long ago in the Odyssey in which I often repeat in my lectures to my students now. All right, yeah, well, good luck. I mean, if people out there have N64s that they're willing to part with, you can direct your, 
your queries to Mr. Schmidt. I'm sure he'll pay you <laughs> handsomely oh, yeah. for it. Um, yeah, but there's always eBay, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I can check Amazon. And uh, we do have GameStops around here, and they're pretty good about selling old stuff. Uh, the game, wow. the gaming Ooh. industry is very good, I would say, about maintaining the past. There's there's a real respect for it and love of it, which is, you know, I think lends itself to collection and collectibles and reminds me a bit of uh, sort of magic cards growing up and then Tamagotchis and, uh, you know, again, something that uh, both West and Eastern culture seem to value, this idea of improving while collecting, the sort of liberal and conservative element to a game, right? Always improving, but also keeping the classics around too. Yeah. That's a, I think that's the mark of a healthy culture. So hopefully the games will help engender that. <laughs> That'd be worth, worth the effort. I agree. Right. I agree. Especially as we become the old fogies, uh, championing the old causes <laughs> rather than the new causes. Uh, <laughs> we can only hope that the young see the value in the things that we saw value in, uh, in the next generation, especially if they are valuable. And I guess that's what we're trying to do. Build that bridge before anybody crosses it. Right on. All right. Looking forward to next week and, and uh, Majora's Mask beyond that. Let's finish this sucker. Let's get this right. guy. Time to end him. I'm coming <laughs> for you, Sephiroth. <laughs> All, right. All right. Until then. Yep.